to the uh, 11th study period here at the British Columbia in Camp 1984, the 7.30 study period on Sunday evening, the 26th of uh, August. Now we've finished the, the um, matching of historical events in the days of the Jews with the actual uh, uh, specification of the prophecy. We now ready to move on in the examination of the second and final fulfilment to prove that there is, there is to be a second and final fulfilment first of all and then the details of what is to transpire during this period of time. But first of all I want to establish a little bit more firmly the principle of two calls and to demonstrate that this is a very sound Bible principle. Now for instance, um, in the again we say in the mouth of two or three witnesses that, that every truth be established. So we need to find some more examples in the scriptures to demonstrate this principle and demonstrate it very clearly. And one of my favourites of course is the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the story so well of, that the man had fallen by the wayside and first of all a priest came by him followed by a Levite and the priest failed to do anything to help the poor man and the Levite in turn after examining the, the uh, victim also went upon his way. Now if you think about the parable carefully you realise of course that Israel had already been called of God to uplift fallen humanity. That was Israel's responsibility, Israel's calling. And any such calling of course is the making of a marriage or a union between God and man because how can any individual or church uplift fallen humanity if he's not united with Christ? It can't be done. So when the priest came by to see the fallen man he was a member of that uh, church, that movement called of God to uplift for humanity and God first of all first of all called the priest of Israel because the priests are the, were the ones upon whom the principal responsibility rested. Now when the priest failed to do his duty and uplift the fallen man by the wayside then God called another Israelite. The second call was to another Israelite in other words the second call was again to Israel this time in the person of a Levite who was not so high as a priest of course but was a, was a second in line so far as responsibility was concerned and the priest simply walked over gave a careful exam or cursory examination of the victim and walked on and left him there now so the first opportunity for Jew and the second had passed did, then, did God then call a third Jew? no he didn't he called a Samaritan right? another, another another people altogether and the Samaritan did what the Jews ought to have done. So the principle of the two causes is very clearly illustrated in that particular story of the Good Samaritan. Let's go back now to the days of Egypt in, in the time of uh, Moses and uh, passing on beyond uh, the days of Joseph and I'll read a statement from the Bible commentary in regard to the ministry of Joseph uh, in the land of Egypt to demonstrate that Egypt literally had a call into union with, um, with God I mean I got the wrong uh, um, right through the ministry of Joseph um, the Egyptians were called into a union with God so that they might um, be with him in a marriage relationship I read now from volume 1 of the Bible commentary, page 1098. The sin of the Egyptians was that they had refused the life which God had so gracious, graciously sent to them through Joseph. Now of course that was not the original uh, Egyptian king who did accept the light God sent through Joseph. It was the later generations of course who turned their backs on that light. But initially when Joseph went to Pharaoh, or was called before Pharaoh and interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, and was told that God's counsel was to store during the seven plentiful years and to then ration out the food during the lean years. The Egyptians obeyed the voice of God through Joseph. A marriage relationship was formed between Egypt and God. Egypt prospered mightily and became the richest nation upon the face of the earth. But then came the unfortunate and seemingly in inevitable apostasy. And um, the Egyptians who had once, I'm not saying of course they became closely united with God but they did at least obey the voice of God in respect to the famine and its problem 
then we would expect to find that before, before Egypt finally became cast off by God forever, we expect to find that there would come two calls to them. And the second of them would have to be when Moses came back from Midian with a rod in his hands. If that was the second, what was the first? Think back a moment and you'll remember that Moses spent the first 40 years of his life, or most of the first 40 years of his life, in the land of Egypt. And during that time he was right at the very nerve centre of government, namely in the king's palace. And there he was in training day by day with another young prince, he the first in, in line for command, and the other prince, of course, second in line for command of Egypt. If Moses died or something happened to him which did, he, he fled the land, of course, the second in line would then take the first in line and become the future pharaoh. Now, during those first 40 years, or most of them, because he stayed at home with his mother for the first few years, Moses fearlessly stood for the principles of righteousness. He would not submit to the pressure of the priests, and therefore daily his life was a telling witness for the truth of God and constituted a very clear call to the Egyptian monarch to turn away from his foolish idols and to worship the true God. But what did the Egyptians do about that first call? They rejected it. And so Moses came back to initiate the second call at the end of the second 40 years of his life and what did the mighty Pharaoh do with the second call? rejected it and what became of Egypt after that point of time they were forever from then till this day they never again have had any opportunity, opportunity to be God's chosen people now let's come down to the Protestant Reformation we'll find the same principle established there again in 1360 or thereabouts no one's sure the exact date but around about 1360 John Wycliffe arose as the morning star of the Reformation in the next century, Hus and Jerome and Bohemia, which, which is now Czechoslovakia, arose to proclaim the living truth of the gospel and suffered and paid for their mission with their lives. They both died at the stake. In the next century, that is the 16th century, or 15, about 1510 or 11, Martin Luther, uh, having gained an experience in justification by faith, arose to power in Germany and preached the mighty Reformation messages. And over this 200 year period from 13 to 1500 we find that the Reformation became established in Europe and a new era had begun and that establishment of course was the making of a marriage as those people entered into a working relationship with God in heaven above through Jesus Christ. But once again what was the sad follow on? Apostasy. Once, once the founding fathers died the people in the movement uh, stopped right where he left them and made no further progress and when you don't make progress going up a stream what do you certainly do you flow back down it again and so to <clears throat> the mighty protestant churches there came the need for a call to revival or a first call to the marriage and that took place in the 18th century or the 1700s when the Wesley brothers in England and the Moravians in Europe uh, brought a tremendously powerful call to the people of those two great nations. And uh, generally speaking, what did the churches at that time do? They rejected the message brought to them in the power of the Spirit, both in Europe and, uh, and in England. But they still remained as God's people because they had not yet received their second call, and their second call obviously came in the 19th century when William Miller and the Advent pioneers carried the truth of the gospel throughout the American world and of course other men like Joseph Wolfe and Henry Drummond the child preachers in Sweden carried the message throughout the length and breadth of Europe now when those churches uh, rejected their second call in the 1844 period then, then how does the Bible describe them as? Fallen Babylon and will those churches ever again between 1844 and the end of time be God's instruments to proclaim the gospel to a perishing world? And the answer is absolutely not. Now these examples, I think about four in number, should convince us that the two calls to the marriage principle is very valid in respect to movements. But mark this point with care. We don't necessarily extend this to individuals. For instance, the people in 18... Um, I'm just going to hear myself in a moment. Well, let's, let's go back to... Um, let's go back to the Protestant Reformation. 
The people in the days of the Westlands who rejected that call were dead and buried by the time the second call came in 1833 to 44. At least many of them were. So that um, in order for individuals to have two calls, they sometimes they would have to live sometimes from one call to the next call, which is often too long a span for them to do that. So we're not talking so much about calls to individuals, which some people seem to think we are. We're talking rather essentially of calls to movements. And when God calls a movement of people, and the people in that movement renounce the message, then even though we pass into the second or third generation thereafter before the second call comes, it's the movement to, to whom the second call comes, and it's the people in the movement who make the second rejection, thereby endorsing the rejection made by their predecessors in the previous or maybe two previous generations. Now having established, I hope I have, the validity of the two call principle to church organisations and movements by giving these several examples, and of course you can search out more too if you want to in the Word of God, let's come down now to look at the, the second and final application of the parable of the wedding garments or the two calls to the marriage. Now first of all, there has to be a marriage before the work can be finished. Maybe I can find a statement quite quickly in early writings where Sister White uh, talking about the close of probation makes the observation that the marriage has been consummated. Not made, but actually consummated. I can just find the statement here around about 283 it should be. Um, it's page 280. Every case had been decided for life or death. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The subjects of the kingdom were made up. The marriage of the Lamb was consummated. Now the, lamb, the marriage of the Lamb should have been but was not consummated back in this first fulfilment because the guests were not gathered to the marriage um, and, because things were not, and because the king didn't come in to see the guests in, in the examination of the investigative judgment the marriage was not consummated now before Christ can return the marriage must be consummated or the union between Christ and his people completely and fully sealed to achieve this the marriage must be made bidden ones must be um, selected by the process of presenting truth to men and those who accept the truth become the accepted uh, bidden ones and all this must be accomplished before the end can come so when the marriage failed in this first application what did God have to do? make another one that, that he did so is very plainly taught in the book Early Writings and also the book uh, Great Controversy I'll turn now to the evidences which are plainly brought to view here First of all, from page 54 and 55 in the book Early Writings, in that very wonderful chapter entitled The End of the 2300 Days. And in this vision, Sister White said, I saw a throne and on it sat the Father and the Son. Then there's quite a paragraph about the beautiful appearance of Jesus Christ and the glory of the Father. Then on page 55, it becomes clear that the throne the sister white saw was in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. Adventists, of course, made a bad mistake when they concluded that Christ was in the first apartment until 1844 and the Father was in the second apartment until 1844. And only in 1844, when Christ entered the most holy place, did they actually come into a working relationship with each other. But the real facts are that Jesus Christ was in the first apartment from his ascension until 1844 and then they both went to the second apartment. And uh, so Sister White wrote on page 55, I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the Bible and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light passed from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose and they were left in perfect darkness those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way then he raised his right arm and we heard his lovely voice saying wait here I am going to my father to receive the kingdom 
keep your garments spotless and in a little while I, re I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself and just so we've got the picture nice and clear in mind I'll draw a picture of the heavenly <coughs> sanctuary on the board tonight <coughs> modelled after the earth or the earthly is modelled after it of course but here are the two apartments and first of all the father and the son were seen together on this throne the father of course was on this side and the son on this side because the son sat on the father's right hand and assume of course they're facing out this way now the father arose from that throne and the flaming chariot went into the most holy place ahead of Jesus Christ by a short span of time when he'd done that Christ arose and, and walked out a little way then spoke to his followers down upon the earth and said to them wait here I am going to my father to receive the kingdom and in a little while I shall return from the wedding now if in coming out he returns from the wedding then what did he go into? the marriage or the wedding and why had the father gone ahead to make the marriage for his son when was this 1844 now of course this is um, even clearer and stronger than the statements which uh, we read before in regard to the first fulfillment now we have a specific date for the actual making of the marriage in this final application now this is further confirmed in the second witness in Great Controversy page 427 I think it should be page 427 and um, I'll just read this paragraph for you now page 427 in the Great Controversy the proclamation behold the bridegroom cometh in the summer of 1844 led thousands to expect the immediate advent of the Lord and what, what was the message behold the bridegroom cometh now to what does the bridegroom come to the marriage who was the bridegroom Jesus Christ and where was the marriage to be conducted in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary at the appointed time the bridegroom came not to the earth as the people expected but to the ancient of days in heaven to the marriage the reception of his kingdom so this statement plainly says in 1844 October 20 to 1844 Jesus Christ came to the ancient of days in heaven to the marriage the reception of his kingdom now those two statements one from Christ I mean one from earlier writings and one from uh, great controversy make it very very plain and back in 1844 the marriage was in fact made by the king for his son the son being Jesus Christ and the king of course being the father so in 1844 indisputably the marriage was made now I mentioned today that in these prophecies we have to have a starting point which is indisputable as indisputable as when um, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar you are this head of gold who can argue with that? nobody can and I, I've noticed with interest that uh, every church I've encountered that does, that does have any kind of prophetic uh, teaching any kind of interpretation of Daniel I've never yet found a single one of them that doesn't designate Babylon as the head of gold it's just too plain to be missed and this is too plain to miss too because the word of God says the marriage was made in 1844 plainly as can be now as we know from many statements in the spirit of prophecy if the people of God had, had gone on following their divine leader then very very soon the marriage would have been consummated and the work finished remember again the statement on page 457 in the book Great right Controversy I'll just remind you we read it just a few days ago and in the statement Sister White says that um, there's a parallel between the uh, exit from Egypt and the past experience of the Adventist body and then she says page 458 if all who had laboured unitedly in the work in 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts a flood of light would have been shed upon the world years ago the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned the closing work completed and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people years ago prior to the writing of that particular book in other words it is only when a church begins to fall away from their original calling that a call to the marriage becomes necessary notice that it was an, to an apostate Israel the first call came not to a, a, a living Israel 
and in the application of the Protestant churches with the apostatized Protestant churches to whom the call came to Pharaoh he was likewise an apostasy when his cause came and so on down the line so then we must expect to find that subsequent to the making of the marriage in 1844 there would come to the Adventist people a call to the marriage must we expect that? we must expect that because the prophecy says so doesn't it? so what we're looking for then is subsequent to 1844 a the selection of um, messengers by God himself um, and there's something very interesting here to remember this that Jesus Christ himself did not give that first call it was given by the 12 and the 70 wasn't it because Christ was the son and he was the prophet and although he was doing preaching himself he didn't give that first call so we don't expect Sister White to give the first call either do we must be given by messengers that God called especially for that work and uh, their message must be the presentation of the gospel and an invitation of the people of God to lay aside their earthly interest to put aside their ways and come to the marriage and come now now when we search through Adventist church history there's only one event which can possibly qualify only, only two men likewise who can possibly qualify to be those messengers and who are those two men? Wagner right. and Jones and between 1888 and 1893 let's put those dates down here now 1888 to 1893 we find that the message went to the people of God according to the terms of the prophecy in fact if we um, quote the prophecy again because that is the first call in, in Matthew 22 I think about verse 3 it says and the king sent forth his servants uh, I'm, going to get the exact, I'm, I'm, I'm just about to quote the second call rather than the first one <clears throat> he sent, it, sent his servants a call then they were bidden to the marriage and they would not come now let's take those words from the Bible God sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come and compare that with the statement in Testament to Ministers page 91 where Sister Wise says the Lord and that's the king in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through his servants elders Wagner and Jones and the Bible says they would not come and what does history demonstrate? they did not come now you know there's been a lot of debate and argument over the, over the past 20 years or more and the Adventist church steadfastly uh, claims that the message was accepted back in 1888 it was accepted they claim it to have been now to make that claim is to ignore or deny the words of this prophecy now can Jesus, is, is Christ a false prophet? certainly not we are learning it we'll learn as we move on later in the week that Christ is the true witness and Sister Wise says in education that Christ spoke the truth because he was the truth not, he just, just didn't speak it he, he was the truth now a liar can tell the truth sometimes can't he but if you are the truth in yourself what, can, what is the only thing you can speak the truth whether it be in prophecy whether, whether he speaks of the future the present or the past Christ speaks only truth so in Jesus Christ the way back here looked down for almost 2,000 two years and declared that God would send messengers to the bidden ones which was the Adventist church at this time those who had been called to the marriage and that the message sent, sent to the bidden ones would be rejected because they would not come then as surely as Christ said those words what has to happen? they would not come and, and if I had no other evidence to prove to me that the message was rejected back in 1888 that prophecy is enough that's enough without all the other evidences now then this was the call back this was the first call back in 1888 through Elders Wagner and Jones and as we know of course the message was rejected and we're still down here in the sinful old world now then when God sent the, the first call to the Adventist people where did they then stand what was, what was their bank account shall we say in spiritual things they still had one more call to come and this answers the question that people often ask well back in Sister Weiss day, the church was very apostate in fact in 1888 you say that the church actually rejected the message of truth how come then that she remained in the church 
right down to her death in such apostate conditions. Uh, and if she did, why don't you remain likewise in the church as she did back there? Now if we go back to the story of the Jews in the days of Christ, what do we find Christ and the apostles doing up until the first and second call have been rejected? What do they do? They stayed in the church. And by, by so doing they did the right and proper thing. But when the second call came to the Jews and had been rejected by the Jews, what then did the apostles do? They separated. Right. They separated. You know, you often hear people say, but the wheat and the tares grow together till the harvest, don't they? So shouldn't, if you think you're good wheat, why, shouldn't you, why don't you stay with the tares until the harvest? Well, I answer by asking a question. And my question is, when was, when, was, when was that counsel given? When did Christ speak those words? And the answer, of course, is before the crucifixion, which is quite true. Now, to whom did he speak them? To his disciples. Very good. Now this means then that if today that parable requires us to stay in the church until the second coming of Jesus Christ because the wheat and the tares must grow together till the harvest, then what right did the apostles have to leave the Jewish church? No. None at all. Because those were just as much present truth to them as they are to us. And in turn, what right did the reformers have to leave the Catholic church? None, because it was present truth then too, wasn't it? And what right did the Adventists have to leave the Reformation churches? Again, none, because it was present truth in their time as well. So therefore, when the Seventh Day Adventist says to you, the wheat and the tares should grow together till the harvest, you should say, now to be consistent with what you're saying, you'll have to go back and join the Reformation churches. When you've done that, go back and join the Catholic church. When you've done that, go back and join the Jewish church, where, where the apostles were when Christ said those words. Any other action upon their power would be inconsistent with their claim. Now what they overlook, of course, is this important point that the wheat and the tares are not all the classes involved. There's a third class which we call the hypocrites or the outright open rejectors of truth. Now the wheat, when the apostles left the Jewish church and formed a new organization or really continued the original organization, <laughs> All of them, well, the, I mean, those that came out with the apostles, not just them, all the apostles, of course, were wheat. We know that. The inspired apostles of Jesus Christ, Peter, James, John, Paul, uh, and so on. But with them, of course, came out a great multitude of people from the Jewish organization, and not all of them were, were wheat, were they? So wheat and tares came out together and separated from the hypocrites and the open sinners. And when the when the uh, Reformation churches left the Roman Catholic Church, then wheat and tares continued to grow together in the Reformation church, but, but they left behind the thorns and the thistles. And likewise in 44, and likewise today. Well, it's true, isn't it? It's absolutely true. Right. Now then, we now face the question then, has the second call as yet come and gone? Because if it hasn't, we're all wrong to be outside the church. Right? But That's right, we're all wrong. We, 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 we better disband this very instant and go back to the church again if the second call hasn't come. Now before we determine whether it has or not, I want you to, to see something quite interesting here and that is this. Open your Bibles to Matthew 22 again and... Um, We'll read the command of God to the servants. And uh, the Lord says to them in verse 8, 9 and 10, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now, do you recognize what this work actually is? When will this be accomplished? During the latter rain. Because this is the final gospel in gathering. And when the wedding is finished with guests, then what follows? The king comes in to see those guests, the judgment takes place, and the end of all things comes. So here we have a picture of the loud cry uh, in operation, or the outpouring of the latter rain, the final in-gathering of souls. Can you see that? Is that clear? Now, let me ask you a question now. Who is it that makes this final ingathering? 
Well, according to the Bible. Servants. The servants. And who are the servants? <coughs> well, the apostles back in the Jewish situation, but today, those of us who have given the call to the church, those of us who have picked up the message of the second call, in other words, uh, well, let's ask the question, who are the bidden ones in this final application of the Adventist church? The Adventist people, the Adventist organization. Okay. Now, if there's one thing which is absolutely clear, and that is this, that the servants, not the bidden ones, will give the final message. Right? Therefore, there's no way in the world the Seventh Day Adventist Church will be participants in the loud cry according to this prophecy. Just as there is no possibility of the Jewish nation being participant in the, in the giving of the loud cry back in, in the days of the former reign, was there? See how the prophecy was fulfilled back there? In the Jewish uh, setting, the prophecy calls for the servants to give the final call call to the Gentiles, to the, to the other class of people, and it, it, it uh, offers no possibility of the bidden ones being participant in the giving of that call. And in the first fulfillment, how much participation did the bidden ones back there have in the giving of the loud cry of the former reign? None whatsoever. And what was true back there must be true again today, mustn't it? The prophecy doesn't tell two different things at all. So you can rest assured today that by the sure word of prophecy the bidden ones or the seventh day of this people as such will have no part in the loud cry of the third angel whatsoever. Which of course is something which they wouldn't believe but the facts of prophecy prove that. Now let's determine whether the second call has or has not come so far. And what we have to look for is some point of time subsequent to 1893 at least a few decades away when God called other messengers to give the exact same message, not a different, but the exact same message given back in 1888 because the invitation to the marriage is the invitation to the marriage. It's the presentation of the gospel, it's the lay of the sin message, it is the third angel's message in verity, it is the fourth angel uh, in his work. And so we ask ourselves the question, has there been a point of time since 1893 when such a message has gone forth? Well, we have to look at one or two um, possibilities. First of all, there was a stirring in the mid-twenties when Elder A.G. Daniels wrote that little book, Christ and His no, Christ Our Righteousness, and um, presented that, and, and it was sold throughout the entire world. But let's face the fact that it did not bring the church to a point of issue. It did not bring the church to a point of decision. It was an interesting book. Many folk read it and said, yes, very nice. We hope someday the message will go, but there was no decision called for. And then Taylor G. Bunch wrote a book entitled The Advent Movement, no, The Exodus and the Advent Movement in Type and Antitype, in which he also laid out the rejection back in 1888. But again, that book caused no particular stir, brought the church to no great decision point. But in 1950 began a movement which did bring the church to a very definite decision point in regard to what they would do with the 1888 message. Elders Whelan and Short were over from Africa where they were missionaries and um, they attended a ministerial uh, seminar or conference of some sort out in Washington DC <coughs> while they were over here prior to the general conference session and um, there were certain presentations in regard to the person of Jesus Christ the work of Jesus Christ which concerned them very deeply because they recognized that there was too much of a drift into an evangelical Protestant type of presentation of Jesus Christ which is the false Christ not the true one and with deep respect and um, well deep respect for the general conference leaders they went before those men and said look we're concerned very very concerned about trends in the Seventh-day Adventist church it's our conviction that uh, back in 1888 God gave the message by which the work would be finished and we would plead with you to make that message available to the entire world church membership. Well, the brethren said, we're interested and uh, we'd like you to present your convictions in writing. So they gave them a room and some, some stenographers and a big library and uh, they went to work. And in a very short time they produced a manuscript entitled 1888 Reexamined. It appeared in the early 1950s. It, well, I say it appeared, it didn't appear in public, it only appeared in the General Conference offices. And the General Conference brethren read it through and they got the point. 
because the point was that there could be no vindication of Adventism, no glorious loud cry and latter rain, until there was a thorough repentance of the rejection which took place back in 1888, and an acceptance of that light by which, by which alone the work could be finished. And the brethren, said we, the brethren said in their reply, which was also in writing, that they recognised the nature of the appeal in the book, but they did not believe that God required them to make that kind of confession. In fact, they insisted that God never requires such a confession, despite the fact that back in Leviticus 26 and verse 40, the, the Lord said, if you, if you will confess your sins and the sins of your fathers. As I mentioned, I think, earlier in the day, there was the um, example of good King Hezekiah, of Daniel and of Ezra and Nehemiah, all of whom confessed the sins of their fathers was their own sins and God mightily blessed them in response. Tremendous results were achieved because of that. And so the brethren turned the message down. Now when they did, they um, asked William and Short to go back to their mission station and leave the whole thing in God's hands. And I understand, well I can't verify the story altogether, that um, there are 30 copies of this manuscript and the General Conference uh, said to Will and Shaw, now look, we won't do a thing about it, don't you do a thing about it, and if God wants this before the people, he'll do something about it. And Will and Shaw agreed that was a good proposition. Well the GC then gathered all these manuscripts in, but except for one, they couldn't find one of them. And that one somehow got out, out to Los Angeles and then up to Baker, Oregon, where Al Hudson has a printing press, and Al Hassan read it through and he recognised the very critical nature of the arguments in that particular manuscript. And being a lawyer or attorney type person, he then carefully prepared a brief, a, a, a paper, a presentation, which he then took to the local church, church pastor, who sent it on to the conference, and the conference sent it on to the union, and that to the division, and that, and that back to the GC. And all the way up the line, the answer was negative. They refused to accept that particular argument on the part of Al Hudson. So Al Hudson then said, all right, he said, I've done my task of taking it first to the church. I'll now give it to all the members. So he printed thousands of copies, which soon became scattered all over the world. In the meantime, and I'll detail this history more thoroughly in, when, we, when we deal with the history in a couple of days' time. In the meantime, down at Avondale College, the long-lost books of Wagner and Jones were found in an old storeroom and when they were brought out and read, this generated a tremendous revival amongst those who read these books. They reached me in New Zealand and uh, I gained in just a few short days the victory I had longed for for many, many years but couldn't find. But everywhere when the message appeared, the church um, began to act with extreme uh, antipathy toward it. And we, we experienced bitter persecution, surprising persecution back in those days. And... Uh, with great clarity, the, the General Conference Committee, the various divisions, the North American Division, the Australasian Division, and other divisions, emphatically said no to the message. They didn't want it. The unions echoed this. The conferences took up the tail and right then to individual churches, there was a universal cry of uh, rejection throughout the entire world field. And only a, only a small scattering of people in various lands were glad to accept this glorious, these glorious truths. And that brought us down to 1962. And by that time, that's 12 years of um, presentation and agitation, struggle and uh, victories and defeats. But by 1962, every official level of the church had turned their backs upon that message, excepting for the general conference and session. That is, all the delegates gathered from all the conferences and unions and divisions around the world. And down in Australia, at that point of time, there were a dozen or so of us who were very, very aware of the fact that this was the last court of appeal, that if the General Conference in Session endorsed the rejection already given by all the other official bodies, then that would be the, that would be the end of our chance of getting the Church to accept it. So we spent weeks and weeks and weeks part of the General Conference Session pleading with God to send mighty angels to San Francisco where the conference was being held, to awaken the delegates to a sense of their responsibility and to reverse the bad decisions made. And we really bent our knees and prayed during that period in the, in the most earnest and agonising fashion. And uh, there were people at the General Conference itself who were trying to get the question discussed and, uh, and studied. But the General Conference adopted the most scornful possible rejection 
they completely ignored the issue. They refused to. They refused to, in any way, deviate from the agenda, the sacred agenda, which must not be changed under any circumstances. And uh, down in Australia, when we heard the sad news, I said, "Well, what do I do now?" And I decided that the best thing I could do now was to go right on preaching salvation from sin, Romans seven and eight, and I did that. And then suddenly there was there was forced upon us unexpectedly. The, the requirement to either completely leave the church or to give up what we were believing and of course we couldn't do that so we were forced to leave the church at that time now by 1962 between 1950 and 1962 without question the the, the, um, the Adventist church faced the the question as to what they would do with the message and by 1962 the decision was made they said absolutely no we will not accept that message so our present history demonstrates quite plainly that a marriage was made back in 1844, a first call came back in 1888 and a second between 50 and 1962 and both the first call and the second call as prophesied was met with a resounding rejection. Exactly as the prophecy said, so it has been. Now will the Seventh-day Adventist Church ever get a third call? No. Never. The prophecy says so and we have a more sure word of prophecy whether you do well that you take heed. In other words, in 1962 the Seventh-day Adventist Church came to the exact same place there as the Jews were in 34 AD. We may find it easier to believe that in regard to the Jews than we can in regard to the Adventists but the facts are it is true in both cases. Now this simply leaves now some, some final events the separation of course has taken place exactly as in the previous examples and let me stress again that when we separated back there we didn't have this to guide us you folk today are much more fortunate or maybe you're not so fortunate but we, 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 we saw this after we had separated and we then recognized we had walked down a prophesied path with great accuracy next comes the loud cry but in between is the tarrying time not revealed, not revealed in this prophecy but revealed of course in the prophecy of the ten virgins which we'll deal with later the guests will be gathered during the loud cry then the king comes in to examine the guests then comes the seven last plagues and the second coming of Jesus Christ now, I guess my time is gone so I'm just hurrying a little bit at the end there I'll just revise some of these points tomorrow morning but you'll recognize that all I've done is to match events with the prophecy just as sister I did back there and the prophecy is very clear very convincing and very powerful I've yet, I've yet to meet uh, even my worst enemies could refute it, although of course they don't, they're not prepared to accept it. Yep. It's interesting to note that during the same period of time of the second call, that was when the Seventh-day Adventist Church was reaching out its hand to the evangelicals. It was holding back its hand from the truth and reaching out to Babylon to reunite itself with Babylon. Right, which is quite significant. Any questions for clarification? Yes, David. Could Rosemead figure into this? Sure. Um, what I plan to do in a couple of days' time is to give a detailed history of the movement based on these prophecies to demonstrate how they have been fulfilled. And Brinsmead was one of the strong voices who agit agitated very powerfully during the 19, for, during the 50, during 1950 to 1962 period. And um, I certainly believe God used him during that period. But later, unfortunately, he, he repudiated all he'd ever, ever taught and apostatized. Any other question? Yes. Uh, I just an observation. In other words, if, if any movement that's been called does apostatize, then there is no coming back. Oh no, no coming back. That's right. There's no way back yes, because. Yes, they reach the call. No third and another movement will have to come. Sure, but but if if God calls the movement, it'll always get two calls. Always, if God calls the movement, the marriage is made followed by two calls. Yeah which is usually at least a generation or two at least one generation apart maybe two generations apart <coughs> well then yeah. that does not apply to the individuals that are within that movement the calling of them out just as the Jews are called out from uh, yeah. the Israelite economy okay. well the folks back in 1880 only got one call when Wagner and Jones preached to them and they turned their backs upon his message that was the end of them wasn't it yeah. and that was a one call but movements get two calls mm -hmm. And, and, and the second call, as I said before, comes at least one generation away, maybe two or three generations away. 
Yeah. Well, it was tighter, much tighter. Yeah. 